All right, I'm going to go ahead and just start off with the title of the sermon. And the title of my sermon tonight is Why God Hates the Catholic Church. Why God Hates the Catholic Church. Now, I want you, I told you we're going to turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. So if you have a bookmark there, go ahead and, and flip back to Nehemiah 8. Keep, keep your finger in Proverbs 6 because we're coming back to this. But in Nehemiah, chapter number 8, we're going we're gonna to read an example of what, what is being done just in the Bible with the, the priests of the Lord, the Levites, and part of their job was to preach God's word and to give the meaning thereof. Now, when we read the Bible, especially, you know, books like the book of Proverbs, you know, we, ha we have the law. The law is pretty straightforward, right? We, we read... Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. We read all these laws and these commandments. And you know, those are pretty straightforward. And I don't think there's any gray area. And I, and I don't think there's any gray area tonight. I don't think God has a gray area. God knows right from wrong. It's us who get confused sometimes as people in how to apply God's wisdom and this knowledge that we can receive from God's word. But someone might right off the bat say, well, how is it that I could preach a sermon about what God hates? Like, who are you to say what God hates? Right? It's the same people that would say that, that, that when we go out and preach the gospel, we'll say, well, who are you to judge who's going to heaven and hell? Right? And what we have to understand, especially in that situation, I try to explain this to people, and sometimes it goes over people's heads. I don't understand why. It's not a difficult concept. But I'm not the one determining who goes to heaven and hell. God makes that determination. But God has given us the, the way that he is going to judge. He's told us how things are. He's told us the way that he is going to judge. So all I have to do is look at this and be like, hey, you're going to hell because God said this. Not because I'm sending you there, but because God's the one who said, if you don't believe on the Son, you don't have life. Amen. That is why, and that's, that's what we do. We're sharing information. We're sharing knowledge. And we're telling people, and I explain that to people, hey, if you don't have Christ, then you don't have life. And the reason why I'm able to preach a sermon about what God hates is because the Bible tells us what God hates. As we're, when we get back to, to Proverbs 6, there's a, whole, there's a whole few verses there that, that say, hey, you know, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination. So the Bible clearly just flat out says, what God hates. And it's not just in that one passage. It's over and over throughout the Bible. When you see words that things are abominable, when you see things are vile, when you see that, that God hates some things, and God hates them. And what we need to do, though, is to be able to apply it properly in, in every aspect of life, to be able to take this wisdom, to be able to understand, well, what are the things that God hates? And then apply it to things where it may not be spelled out specifically by name, but you can look at characteristics and attributes and properties of whatever it is that you're trying to judge. Yes, judge, because we all have to judge right from wrong. Hopefully you're judging on a daily basis, by the way. Hopefully you do judge. Hopefully you judge what is right and what is wrong. I hope when you have decisions to make that you're actually judging and determining, hey, what's the right thing to do in this situation? Judge is not an evil word. It's not a curse word. It's not a bad word. It's not a word we should shy away from. Jesus Christ himself said, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We don't just judge on the surface. We need to get down to the, to the, to the core and understand right from wrong, but we need to judge. We need to judge righteously. And that's something that everybody does, whether you want to admit it or not. And that's what's something everyone should do. We need to determine right from wrong. We need to know what is right and what is wrong. The Bible tells us what God's hate, and it's the preacher's job to make this application of God's word today. Now, that doesn't mean it's not your job too. Look, your job is to read your Bible every day. Your job is to, is to gain wisdom and gain understanding and make the choices for yourself. But, it, but one of the responsibilities of a pastor, of a teacher of God's word, is to be able to go ahead and take this knowledge and apply it to the world we live in today. That's one of the benefits of coming to church is to be able to receive that and be like, wow, I never even saw that connection before, 
wow, I'm glad that I could hear God's word being applied to things today, that things that just happen. In, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about motion pictures, movies, right? It's not, it's not mentioned by, because why? Because the technology wasn't around at that time. But you know what? There's plenty of attributes that you could use to look at whether or not a motion picture is something that you should be putting in front of your eyes or not. Because they're not all wicked. Not every motion picture, not every set of frames that, that give the, gives the appearance of movement is wicked or wrong or false. But what is contained in those images can be wicked and can be something that you should never put in front of your eyes. And God's word helps us understand what things should we be looking at and what things should we not. I'm not getting into that tonight. It's just another example of how we use wisdom from God's word to apply it to our regular daily life. Now, if the preacher's job was not to make an application of God's word, all we would really need to do then is just read the passage like we did. We read Proverbs 6, and then we could just all just say, okay, well, we're going home now. Obviously, there's more to it than just that. We all should be reading the Bible anyways. But Nehemiah chapter 8 spells this out. Look at verse number 7 of Nehemiah 8. The Bible says, Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, Hakab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly. So what they do first? They're reading the law. They read it distinctly. They're reading every word and gave the sense and cause them to understand the reading. So they don't just read the law and say, well, that's it, we're going home, there you go, it's God's law. No, they give them the understanding. They help them to understand, hey, when God said, you know, not to do this, not to, not to bow down before any graven images, he's talking about that, that molten little statue of whatever animal that that is, that you've got at home. And, you know, at the time, it can be maybe something that's real popular, something that a lot of people have, something that's in with the times. And they could say, hey, this is what God's law says. And we're applying it because that is exactly what he's talking about. That is what you should not have in your house. That is what you should not be bowing down to. And that's the job. That was the job of the Levites. They were the ministers of God in God's house. And in the New Testament, that is transferred to the pastor, bishop, elder, whatever you, name, you, title you want to give the person who's the overseer of the flock of God, of the, of the local New Testament church. Same position. Still expounding on the word of God. So before you say, oh, what, what gives you the right? Who are you to say? Well, I have God's word. And you know what? We're all looking at God's word today. You should have a Bible in your hands as we turn to these passages. Now, if you think I'm wrong in the application, that's fine. Okay, but don't, don't, first of all, don't hate God's word. That's, that would be a problem, you know, that's a big problem between you and God. But these words need to be applied somehow. Go back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. So we're going to look at this. We're going to use this actually as an outline Let me also add this about the sermon tonight. And I, I, I mention this every single time that I preach about or against a particular religion or a group of people because when it comes to this religion, when it comes to the Catholic Church, there's a lot of Catholics out there. And the purpose of the sermon is not to say, oh, we're so much better and smarter than they are Oh, look how dumb they are. Oh, look what they've fallen for. Oh, look what they believe. Can you believe this? That's not the purpose at all. Not even close. When I say that the God hates the Catholic Church, he does. He hates the institution. He hates the leadership for sure. He hates the fact that there's this false religion out there that teaches a works-based salvation. He hates it. He hates that, that the Catholic Church is damning people to hell. And we're going to see in all these instances why God, you know, the things that God hates, how they apply to the Catholic Church. But this isn't an attack on any one individual that goes to a Catholic Church and they think they're doing the right thing. It's not an attack on them 
But hopefully what we can do with a sermon like this is to expose how unbiblical, how anti-Christian, how against the Bible that their beliefs really are, that the beliefs of the Catholic Church really are. That's the goal of this. The goal is to bring to light the truth and hopefully just help people to see, wow, I've been duped. Wow, you actually got a good point there. I see that the Catholic Church is in error and actually it's very wicked and this is wrong and they shouldn't be doing that. That's the goal. It's bringing awareness. And also to help you to understand a little bit <coughs> how wicked it really is. Because when something is very prevalent in a society, especially things that are wrong or wicked or bad, we have a tendency to become desensitized and think that things really aren't that bad. Oh, it's not really that big of a deal, right? We go out soul winning, I tell people, you know, try to explain when people think they don't deserve hell, but show them what God actually says about it. We have a tendency to think, oh, well, everybody lies, so it's kind of not that big of a deal. Right? But it is a big deal. God has a punishment of hell on telling a lie. So it's a very serious sin. It's very wicked. And just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it okay and doesn't mean that we should even think about it as really not that bad. Because it is bad. And just because there's millions and millions and hundreds of millions of Catholics in the world, I don't know what the number is, however many, it's a lot. It's a lot of people. It doesn't make it any less wicked that that institution exists. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't hate the Catholic Church. Now, let's make the application. Look at uh, Proverbs 6, verse number 16. We'll, we'll, we'll read these four verses, and then, I, and then I'll go into them one at a time. The Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. So this is how we know what God hates. And you can apply this to anything that's applicable, anything that makes sense. Because God hates all of these things. But what we're applying them to tonight is I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the proud look, the lying tongue, the hands that shed innocent blood, the, the heart that devised wicked imaginations, the feet that are swift and running to mischief, the false witness that speaketh lies, and he that sow discord, discord among the brethren within the, the Catholic Church. And if I could demonstrate these things, if I could show you these things, if I could show you the Catholic Church is guilty of these things, then it should be a no-brainer to say, well, yeah, God hates the Catholic Church. Let's start with the first one, pride, a proud look. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 23. The first thing that comes to mind for me, and probably in a lot of people's minds, if you just think of the Catholic Church in general, what, what type of imagery comes to your mind, especially in relation to pride? What is pride anyways? Well, pride is when you're, you're lifted up. Pride is um, it's a very wicked sin, but, but it's when, when you think you're better than other people, when you're lifted up, and you demonstrate it. Look, it says a proud look. So you're either looking down on people or maybe you're dressed in a way to make yourself look better than everyone else. Jesus addresses this in Matthew 23. We're going to get there in a minute. But whenever someone mentions the Catholic Church, the first thing I think of is, you know, the Vatican and the Pope and these cardinals and bishops that are all decked out in their holy apparel with their big hats, right? And walking around like they're royalty. Literally. Or how about when people come and kiss the ring of the Pope? And tell me that's not pride. And you, and you look on the face of that guy when he's got people kissing his ring. Tell me that's not a proud look. 
Jesus Christ does a good job, I believe, also describing, even though he's talking about the, the Pharisees as, uh, at his day, there is no difference in the appearance or the look of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pharisees. They both love the show. They both love the appearance and the look. And um, regardless of what doctrine they hold to, it's the same type. Look at verse number 5, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 25, excuse me, Matthew 23, verse number 5, the Bible reads, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. This is what's in their heart. What they care about is other people seeing them. In their heart, they don't really care about being right. They just want to, they just want to look good in the eyes of others. They care about the admiration of men. They care about being exalted and lifted up in the eyes of of people, their heart is not in it, but all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So right away, he's talking about what do they wear? The borders of their garments. Oh, they have these really nice borders and frills and all this stuff. It's really ornate. Why? So people can look at that and lift them up. Oh, how beautiful. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. The best places to sit. I'm lifted up. I'm, and, and physically, you know, the uppermost rooms at feasts. I've got the, the best room in the house. And greetings in the markets. To be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. And we're going to get into this in just a minute. But think about it. What is it that the, that the Pope gets everywhere he goes? He gets the royal treatment. Right? He's going to be getting the uppermost rooms. and He's going to be getting the greetings in the marketplace. He's wearing all the fancy clothing to lift himself up. That's all pride. God hates a proud look, and we know that. And look at what it, said. Look at what it says here in verse number 8. Because they love being called rabbi. Now, what does rabbi mean? It's like a teacher or instructor or a father. Or actually, what the, the actual literal translation would be a master. Because he said they love being called rabbi, rabbi, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master. And that's where we get the translation from. So when he's saying, hey, don't be called rabbi because you've got only one master, he says, even Christ and all ye are brethren. So he's saying you shouldn't be lifting up people so much. Hey, you're all brethren. If you're saved, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. You shouldn't be establishing yourself as some God-man, which is what they see as the Pope. And what does Pope even mean? It's like the Papa, the Father. He is the vicar of Christ here on earth. He's supposedly the one that's like in Christ's stead, giving commandments as if he's Christ on this earth. And they elevate the status of a man. When the Bible says, no, you're just brethren. There's no one of you over against another that's better. He's saying, you are not a master. You are brethren. In verse number nine, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. But what does the Catholic Church call that they're priests? Father, holy father, father. It always boggles my mind how you can have just crystal clear verses. And people want to refuse God's word so much that they'll go to any length to try to explain away why it's really not that big of a deal. Oh, no, no, you don't understand. Of course, he says, you know, when there's one father, you know, we, we, we're recognizing him as God. So we're not calling our priest God. But that's not what he said. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. <coughs> These are titles that religious men have. Rabbi is a title in the Jewish church, the Jewish synagogue, the Jewish faith. It means master. 
Father is a religious title in the Roman Catholic Church that is not to be given among men because you have one father, you have one rabbi, you have one master. And master, it says in verse number 10, neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. You'll even have the Baptists that'll go out and say, oh yeah, you know, these Catholics, they're calling their priest father, yet they go and they get a master of divinity. And they've got the title master associated with their name in a teaching in a religious sense. You hypocrite. Don't be called master. Don't be called father. Don't be called rabbi. Jesus Christ's words. Why do, you not, why do people not have the fear and reverence and respect for God's word, for Jesus Christ to say, hey, if Jesus said it, then I'm not going to be called that. Let's eliminate that title. But why do they even have the title? It's all for pride. It's all for people to, to lift them up. God hates pride. That's why they don't correct people. When, if someone were to come to me and say, Father Versions, I'd be like, no. No, I'm not father, I'm brother. You call me brother. That's why Jesus Christ said, hey, you're all brethren. You notice we use the word brother a lot here when people are saved or they're brothers in Christ. Brother. And you'll hear pastors calling each other brother. I call Brother Anderson or Brother Jimenez or Brother, you know, Brother, Brother. Why? Because we're brothers. And there's nothing, it's, it's completely biblical, but we're not calling anyone Father. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against me, against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, we're going to stop there. We're, we're done with Matthew 23, but along with this pride, what you have is these people that, this, he's saying right off the bat, he's saying, you're not saved and you're not even allowing people who would get saved to get saved. You're keeping people back from the kingdom of heaven. And that is what the Catholic leadership is doing today. They're not saved. They're not born again. They're not believers on the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as their Savior. They're trusting in their works. And they're not allowing others to go in through their damnable heresies and doctrines of devils. But notice one of the other attributes he gives to these Pharisees, to these hypocrites. He says, you devour widows' houses. You have no problem stealing money from the widows, taking that money and, and telling them, oh, no, you've sinned. Here's the price tag on that sin. You say, okay, the church, have you ever heard of the indulgences? Yes, the indulgences. It's a, it's, a, it's a part in the Catholic history that they don't want you to know about. Now, I don't think this is even stopped today. They don't call it by the same name. But you know this still happens. The indulgence, they actually used to have a list of sins that you could commit and how much money you'd have to pay the church in order to get those sins absolved. You'd have someone praying for you or whatever and, and you just pay a price for your sins. It's wicked as hell. That's not how, how God works. That is nowhere found in the Bible. The Bible condemns that. But this is the way that you can devour widows' houses Right? You don't care about the poor people. You just care about their money. You just care about your, your ornate temples and all this artwork and just, and just everything that costs the money and getting that money rolling in. That's what you care about. You don't care about the widows themselves. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. 
And why do people make long prayer? What does it mean by long prayer? Does it mean, you know, like we had the prayer challenge and we're praying for 15 minutes a day and that's long prayer? That's not what it's talking about. It's saying for a pretense or for a show, you're making a long prayer. And what they're doing is they're using their words, their oratory skills to lift themselves up so I can speak with such eloquence and people can be like, oh, wow, how holy. What a holy man of God that is that's able to pray for so long and use such nice words and basically give a speech in your prayer. The, the reason why they do that is because they want to be lifted up. It's the pride thing again. They want to show off their skill and how good they are instead of just praying from the heart. And it's all phony anyways. That's what the Bible says. It's in pretense. They're just, they're just doing it to show off. They're doing it to try to get people to respect them and, and to get people to lift them up into thinking that, oh, wow, they're such a holy man of God, a holy person. That's all part of their pride. Now, the next point I want to cover here from Proverbs chapter 6, it says, a proud look, a lying tongue. So number two of the seven things that the Lord hates, that, that seven things are abominable in Proverbs chapter 6, Number two is a lying tongue. But you know what? It's not just number two. Because it's also number six. Verse number 19 says, A false witness that speaketh lies. So you have a lying tongue and a false witness that speaketh lies. God mentions a liar twice. He's giving this very short list of things that he hates. And he mentions false witness and lying twice. What should that tell you about how God feels about liars? And lying. And going back to my previous point about lying, right? We have a tendency to think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, everybody lies. Well, God mentioned it twice in his list of things that he hates. Two times. Nothing else is mentioned twice. Lying is mentioned twice. This is probably the number one thing, in my opinion, that the Catholic Church is guilty of, is lying. Why? Why do I say they're lying? Because they actually have God's Word. They have a Bible. And they teach against it all the time. They teach lies all the time. There's so many lies. The majority of their doctrine is lies. Now, they get some things right, but the vast majority of their teachings and the core of their teaching is a bunch of lies. And I'm not going to get into all of the doctrines. I don't have enough time for that. But the number one, the number one doctrine that they lie about is a doctrine on salvation, is how to be saved and go to heaven. And this is how they're damning the most number of people to hell. And I'll tell you what, God hates that. The, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And through the Catholic Church, nobody is coming to repentance. Because they're not showing the right way. They're not pointing to Jesus. They're pointing to the law. Within the Catholic Church, if you want to be saved... Now, first of all, before I begin in salvation, they teach this, this lie of purgatory. They try to... They, they come up with, like, this third destination that a person can go to after they die on this earth, physically, when the Bible only speaks about heaven and hell. I got news for you. When... When they teach on purgatory, purgatory is really just hell. But the only difference is that, oh, well, you're only there temporarily. Well, the Bible never teaches that hell is temporary in any way, shape, or, or form, and the word purgatory is never found in Scripture. Not one time. So that is a lie that's being taught. And the reason why that lie is taught is because many people understand and they know, hey, I don't deserve heaven. I've done some things that are wrong. I, I, deserve, I, I don't deserve it. I deserve a punishment. But when the Catholic Church is teaching you that you obey all these commandments and you're going to be saved, well, people, you know, a lot of people are going to be like, well, I don't deserve it. So what's going to happen to me? I've done these. I've committed these sins, these cardinal sins. They say, well, because I've got to string you along. I mean, if, if, you, if they just said, well, you just don't have any hope, you're not going to keep going back and giving them money. So they have to string you along. They say, well, there's this, other, there's this place called purgatory. And the reason why it's called purgatory is because it purge, it's supposedly it's supposed to purge you of your sins. 
Now, how is that not blasphemous enough already? As if what Jesus Christ did when he died on that cross and shed his blood and was buried and rose again the third day isn't enough to purge you from your sins. The Catholic Church lies to you and says, oh no, there's this place that you go to where God is just going to purge you of all those sins and then you'll get to go to heaven. It's a lie out of hell. They add that because they don't believe that what Christ did is enough to pay for your sins. Because when they teach their salvation doctrine, they tell you that you got to keep the sacraments. If you want to make sure that you go to heaven when you die, you got to keep all the sacraments. You got to be baptized. You've got to keep communion. You have to go confess your sins to a Catholic priest. You have to do all of these things. You have to be confirmed in the Catholic Church. You have to do all of this work. And then, maybe, if you're good enough, if you say enough Hail Marys, if you say enough Our Fathers, then maybe you can get to heaven. And it's a lie. It's a lie out of the pit of hell. They deny Scripture. They deny the Bible. They deny Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life through their teachings. And they're sending people to hell on a regular basis, probably more. I don't, I mean, maybe it's more than any, any other religion out there. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of false religions out there. God hates the lying tongue. God hates a false witness. And they also lie about Mary. Think about their doctrine. They, they, they lie. How do they lie about Mary? Well, one of the things they believe is that, you know, as we do, we believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. We believe that Mary was a virgin. She did not know a man. She was a spouse of Joseph, her husband, but they did not come together in union as husband and wife prior to Jesus Christ being born. They got that right. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It is a miracle. And it did happen. But what they teach is that she remained a virgin even after that. Which is just bizarre and weird. The Bible records Jesus Christ had brethren. He had brothers and sisters. Physical brothers and sisters on this earth. Now either God just continued to perform miracles and that all of his brothers and sisters were all born as she was a virgin which the Bible never says that, or she had a regular marriage with her husband after Jesus was born. Which one do you think is a lot more likely to be true? Especially given what the Bible tells us. About everything. And, and you know what? Mary was a sinner. Because Mary is not God. But that's another lie they'll teach you is that they call Mary the mediatrix. So in Scripture tells us there is, there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. There's one mediator. What the Catholic Church teaches is that there's also a mediatrix. There's a go-between between you and Jesus, and that's Mary. And, oh, you can pray to Mary, and then she'll talk to her son about it. And they call her, you know, the mother of God. Another blasphemous title that the Bible never gives Mary. And, in fact, when you look at the Bible, how much does the Bible even talk about Mary? Almost not at all. Why? Because she's not a key player. Now, was she honored? Do I believe she was a very good woman? Yeah, I believe she was. God chose her for a reason. It's not to, to trash Mary, you know, what, what we believe, but we're definitely not going to exalt her above what, what the Bible just tells us about her. She is not the mother of God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ in the form of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was without mother, without father. He has no beginning of days nor end of life. Jesus Christ is eternal. Yes, he was physically born into this world, physically, but he existed before that. Mary was not the mother of God like she just spawned God. She was a vessel that was used to carry that human being to full term, to be born into this world. That's all she was, a vessel. 
Her and Joseph raised Jesus Christ in their home from a child. But she, she is not the mother of God. And she is not another mediator or mediatrix that we have to go and communicate with God or with Jesus. There is nobody that needs to be between us and him. There's no Catholic priest. There's nobody that you need to go to. You can go directly to God. We can come boldly unto the throne of grace. As the Bible says in Hebrews. Lying tongue, false witness, purgatory, work salvation. So many of the, I mean, we could go on and on and on about the doctrines that are just full of lies. We're going to get into a few more, but we're going to cover that in another point. God hates a lying tongue. He hates a false witness. He hates the lies. He hates the, the men that are using the word of God deceitfully. And they're deceiving people by just completely taking a scripture out of context and, and explaining things away that are very clear. Like when Jesus said, don't call any man your father upon the earth. Oh, yeah, but that's okay because we can call priest father because it doesn't really apply to that. Don't worry about how clear he was, clearly he was stating that. What about hands that shed innocent blood? Just do a little bit of a, of a history check into the Catholic Church. You want to talk about hands that have shed innocent blood. Look up a time period. Look up, look up these words, the Inquisition. Because there hasn't just been one. There's been multiple Inquisitions. Probably the most famous would be the Spanish Inquisition. And what happened during this time, this is during the Dark Ages, when the Catholic Church is just basically in power. Like Babylon. Just totally in charge, in control, of things going on in the world. And what they did was they were seeking out people who they called heretics. People who didn't believe the Catholic Church. People who taught against the Catholic Church. And they would inquire, as well, the Inquisition. They would arrest these people. They would torture these people and get them to confess and get them to recant whatever they were teaching and even if they confessed, sometimes they would still kill them, torture them, burn them at the stake, whatever they would do, put them to death, innocent people. And these are the people, you know, a lot of, you know, they, they murdered a lot of people. But you know who they murdered? Would be believers, people who actually believe like the way that we believe today. The Catholic Church persecuted and killed the blood of innocents in mass numbers. Two real famous examples. I'll only give you two that were, that were put to death at the, at the, under the authority of the Catholic Church. John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. And if those names sound familiar, they should because those are two names of men that are, are very... Uh, very influential and responsible for giving us the Bible that we have today. They cared about the common man having the word of God. See, the Catholic Church, during the Dark Ages, when they controlled everything, they didn't want people to have Bibles. They didn't think that you could read it on your own and understand God's word. They were withholding the kingdom of heaven from people by withholding God's word from them. And when people challenged that, and they said, no, this is too important. No, people need to hear. They need to receive the word of God. We need to translate this. We need to get this into the language of the common people. And they said, no. And they put people to death. William Tyndale was burned at the stake under the authority of the Catholic Church. You want to talk about innocent blood being shed. Those are just two examples. You can read through, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is all historically accurate. You can look at the people that they killed 
and it's fact. There's blood on their hands. The Bible says in Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's a big deal to God. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. Now, how, what's the next thing that God hates? A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Wicked imaginations, and heart that deviseth wicked. How, how would that apply? Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. How does this apply to the Catholic Church? Hearts that devise wicked imaginations. And again, I'm not referring to the average person that will attend a Mass on a Sunday. We're talking about the leadership. We're talking about, you know, who's really in charge of the Catholic Church. Well, how much more wicked of an imagination can you have than of one that defiles children? Another one of their lies is, is saying that, you know, oh, men of God or a priest should be celibate, should not be married. When the New Testament clearly states that if you want to be a bishop, you need to be the husband of one wife. Again, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's mind-boggling. How could you look at clear, at just, just read the Bible, just read it, read the text, and then come up with this nonsense and say, well, no, actually what the Bible means is that you shouldn't be married. We have the, they want to call Peter their first pope. Peter was married. According to Scripture, the Bible records Peter's wife's mother being sick, and Jesus went and healed her. By name, Peter's wife's mother, his mother-in-law. He was married. You have 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to get into their different titles and names for positions. But they have bishops. Are there bishops married? Regardless of what, of what position they hold, they have a position called a bishop in the Catholic Church. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Sorry to confuse you with, with, with Scripture, with just what the Bible says. A bishop then must. Is, does that sound like it's optional? No, but what does the Catholic Church teach? A bishop must not have one wife. It's like they insert a not. They must not be blameless. They must not be the husband of one wife. They must not be vigilant. They must not be sober. How many Catholic priests do you know of are just a bunch of drunks anyways? It's rampant. You've got these wicked imaginations from these wicked bishops, these wicked priests that defile little children. They get their altar boys come in and do work for them and they, they defile them in their quarters. And, there's, and you know what? There's never any responsibility for it either. I mean, it's bad enough that it even happens, but what do they do? They shuffle people around. They, they sweep it under the rug. People have known about this for so long, yet they continue to go back. What in the world? Defiling a child has got to be one of the worst things ever that anyone can ever do to someone else. It's got to be. I, don't, I mean, I, it, it, it's going to be hard-pressed to think of something worse than that. It's disgusting, it's wicked, it's abominable, it's filth, it's vile, and people like that need to just be put down immediately. Yet, why is it? Now, I'm not saying that this never happens in any other religion, but there's, there's false prophets that creep in everywhere. But look at the abundance 
Look at the abundance within the Catholic Church. A false prophet can be anywhere, but this is like characteristic of the Catholic Church. It's not a one-off. It happens all over the place, all the time. Wicked imaginations. Another wicked imagination, and it is, this is something that's conjured up in their minds, is their doctrine of transubstantiation. I know it's kind of a big word, but all that literally means, what, what they believe, because you know the Catholic Church, they, I think they take, I mean, depending on where you go, I'm sure, but they do their communion every week. We go and you receive the, you know, the cracker and you drink the wine. And I don't, even, you know, I don't even think they do the wine every week. I think they just do like the cracker every week. I don't know if it's always wine, but regardless, right? It doesn't matter. That's, there's so many things that you could, you could pull apart as to why that's wrong anyways with what they do and the way they practice and giving alcoholic wine and things like that. But the... the, the their belief of transubstantiation, they literally believe that when you eat that cracker, that it literally is the flesh of Jesus Christ that becomes flesh like in your mouth while you're eating. And that the wine literally becomes his blood. Like it's, like it's literal. It's not figurative. It's literal. That's what they believe. Now, what kind of a wicked imagination is going to come up with this cannibalistic teaching of, yeah, when you eat this cracker, it actually literally turns into Jesus Christ's flesh and blood. It's weird. It's bizarre. Another doctrine of devils, and it's another thing that God hates. Another thing that God hates about the Catholic Church. I had to turn to John chapter 6 because this is where they get it from, but any normal reading of God's word in John chapter 6 should tell you that he wasn't literally talking about his flesh. Verse number 32, the Bible reads, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have, have seen me and believe not. So now he explains, he says, well, I am the bread of heaven. I am that manna that came down from heaven. That's me. That, that was representative. What happened with Moses in the wilderness is representative of me. I'm the one who came down from heaven. I am that bread of life. And if you come to me, he says, you're never going to hunger. If you believe on me, you'll never thirst. So what's the first thing that he says when he brings up that he's the bread of heaven? Is he saying, well, if you actually take a bite out of my arm and chew it up and swallow it, then you'll have eternal life. No, he says, if you come to me, if you believe on me, then you have eternal life because he's using the bread of life figuratively as a fulfillment of what happened with Moses. Look at verse number, we're going to jump down to verse number 47. <coughs> he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Again, believe. What is he stressing? The belief. Verse number 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Did Jesus Christ give his flesh for the life of the world? Yes, he did. He gave his flesh when he sacrificed himself up to be crucified on the cross. And he died for our sins. That's how he gave his flesh. He's not saying, I'm giving you my flesh right now. I'm going to chop off a piece for you to put in your mouth and eat. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, the Jews didn't understand it. The Catholics also don't understand it. Why? Because neither one of them were saved. Neither one of them are putting their faith and their trust in Christ alone. Verse number 53 
So now, as they don't understand this saying, well, how is he going to give us flesh to eat? Jesus answers them. He said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And see, the Catholics see that and they go, wow, oh man, we better eat his flesh and drink his blood. How are we going to do that? And don't understand a word of what he's saying. Just like the Jews didn't. So they come up with these bizarre doctrines saying, oh, yeah, yeah. So when we give you this bread, it actually becomes flesh. And when you drink the wine, it actually becomes blood. Because if, if we're not doing that, then we don't have any life in us. He's already said twice it's about believing. Verse 54, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. These are the verses that just become so confusing. But when we're reading them in context, it's really not that confusing. Verse number 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, was Jesus physically a loaf of bread? No, of course not. He's illustrating something. Did Jesus really mean that you have to physically eat of his flesh and drink of his literal blood to have eternal life? Of course not. He told people, he told people that they had eternal life when he was on the earth. And guess what? They weren't eating his flesh and they weren't drinking his literal blood. They came to him and believed on him as he already said he was talking about. Let's keep reading here though because he does clarify it. Verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying who can hear it. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. What does quickeneth mean? It means make alive. He's talking about receiving eternal life or everlasting life. He says, it is the Spirit that quickeneth. The Spirit brings life. The Spirit is going to make you alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what did they need to receive of Jesus to get life? The words. They needed to receive the word of God that he was preaching unto them and believe on Christ. That is how you receive of that bread of life. It's not by physical consumption of flesh and blood, that is just weird. That is, that's just weird. That's bizarre. Especially when you have God's law, God's own law in the Levitical law teaching that you are not supposed to drink the blood. You're not supposed to eat blood. That is against God's law. And you think that the way to be saved then is all of a sudden going to be to drink the blood, literal blood, when God's law already said no, bizarre it's a wicked it's a wicked imagination that comes up with this stuff and god hates it what's the next thing in our list here he that so um, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations feet that be swift in running to mischief now some of the examples i gave are, are based on their doctrine some of the examples i gave especially with the shedding blood is, are things that happen maybe a little, a little older in, in history. But feet that are swift in running to mischief. Mischief is like causing problems, right? Bringing their deceits and their lies and just, and just causing a bunch of problems. They're, they're getting into trouble, causing mischief. Well, very, very recently, the Vatican hosted a conference it was called Unite to Cure. 
And I guess the point of this was they were bringing in like all these various celebrities and people to talk about all kinds of different things to find cures for different problems in the world. And they're just yoking up with, with whoever, with the, world of the, with the wisdom of the world or whatever. And, you know, of course, the Catholic Church is supposed to be Christian. They're supposed to be believers of the Bible. That's what they portray themselves as, right? But what do they do? They end up causing mischief. They, they promote the wisdom of the world as well as just purely satanic trash. I read about this a little bit, and it's, inter it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how, how, what a lack of information there is out there in general. People like putting up these headlines and articles about things, but it's, it's, I found it harder to find really concrete information of what was going on there. Now, I was only slightly interested anyways. It's not like I would want to read everything that happened there. I saw enough of what was going on there to see how wicked and, and purely satanic it is. They actually invited Katy Perry. If you're familiar with who that is, that pop singer who started off her career supposedly as like a gospel singer who was raised in a family of Christians and, and came out with that, that song. Um, I think it's called like I Kissed a Girl or something like that and became real popular about a sodomite experience of a girl Kissing another girl. Wicked as hell. And corrupting and defiling the minds of young people all across the world. She sold herself out. She, sold her, she already has admitted publicly that she sold her soul to the devil to get, to get fame in the music industry. When she was there, they're, they're, they're passing out. This, and, and the reason why she was invited to talk, by the way, this sodomite, this God-hater, this reprobate was invited to talk to the Catholic Church, which, again, I mean, I think it's just indicative of who they're hanging around with, of what they're, they're from the same vine. They're from the same branch. They're not from Christ. They're of their father, the devil, just as she's of her father, the devil. They're all sons of Belial. She was invited to talk about transcendental meditation. Yeah. Hindu transcendental meditation. That's what the Vatican invited her, the reprobate, the sodomite, to talk to, to talk about transcendental meditation and how helpful that is. And, and teach the religion of Hinduism at the Vatican. Some people, some Catholics were actually upset about that. Oh, I wonder why. Some of those who, were who have been deceived, again, the people that we're not necessarily preaching against today, the people who have just honestly been deceived, and they're doing things ignorantly in unbelief, as the Apostle Paul did. We want those people to get saved. We want, we want these people to see the hypocrisy. And that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't an oversight by the Vatican to invite sodomite Katy Perry in to speak about uh, uh, Hindu, Hinduistic rituals. Not an accident. That was done on purpose. God hates the Catholic Church. God hates the Pope. The man that's calling himself Father. When there's one Father. We're almost done. Let's look at this list. Feet that be swift to running in mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. So there's lying again. We already covered that. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, the discord that is sown among brethren. Brethren are people that are saved. God hates when people cause strifes and sow discord among, among people who are supposed to be in unity with each other. So if people sow discord among brethren, 
where I think this happens probably most commonly would just be within the homes. The people that the Catholic Church has already influenced and is causing problems now within families where you've got some of the family that are saved and some of the family that are not because they're Catholic and just causing more problems within these homes just through all their false teaching. Because their, their teachings are, are, I mean, they're teaching it to their crowd and their congregation. So they're not sowing discord among, you know, the, the people that are congregating in the Catholic Church are not brethren, they're not saved. But the discord that would be sown, I think, is going to come through their false teaching, the false doctrines, into other families, into other um, circles of people where you're going to have, you know, maybe devout Catholics as relatives or something like that. Now, the last point I want to make on why God hates the Catholic Church. And you could lump this in with their lies because all of their false doctrine could be lumped in with their lies. It's their idolatry. If there's one thing that God really, really hates from his creation is when people put other gods or other images that are worshipped as gods before God. And they put these things up and, they, and they, they bow down and worship idols and statues and graven images. God hates that. That is, what, that is why God punished his own people. That is why he allowed his own people to be taken into captivity. Why? Because of idolatry. That is why an individual is given over to a reprobate mind. Why? Because of idolatry. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, became vain in their own imagination, their foolish heart is darkened. They start worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We see that in Romans 1. We see that all throughout the Bible. God hates when his people, when anybody, what is given over to idolatry. And they build these statutes. Exodus chapter 20 gives us the Ten Commandments. I talk to a lot of Catholics that tout the Ten Commandments. They say, you know, what, when I ask them, what do you have to do to be saved? Well, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. Right? I get that answer frequently, very frequently. Oh, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. You missed out on the first two. Why don't you start reading them? Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3, the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Should we make engraven images? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. What's that referring to? Well, anything in heaven, that would be angels. That would be people who are, they would call maybe saints who are in heaven. That would be um, <coughs> maybe just flying things into heaven here like birds, things that are in the earth, animals, people, or that is in the water under the earth, fish, any type of, of anything. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty broad. Heaven, earth, water. Don't make any images, any graven image or any likeness of anything in any of those places. Sounds like God doesn't want us making images of things. Just making these graven images and these statutes. He says, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So neither nor. You don't do one or the other. You don't bow down to them and you don't serve them. You don't do either one. See, what they'll say is that when we bow down to the statue of the Virgin Mary, we're not actually serving her. Well, you shouldn't be bowing down to her. You shouldn't be bowing down. That's not her, to a statue. It's not even a person. It's a thing. It's an object. It's a graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. When you are just willfully going against God's word and you can see in black and white, he says, don't make any images. Don't do that. Don't bow down yourself to them. And you just say, you know what we're going to do to serve God? You know what we're going to do to worship God? We're going to make an image and we're going to bow down to it. 
Well, I'll tell you what, God hates that, and he hates it so much, he says, I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Third and fourth generation, that's your kids, that's your grandkids, that's your great-grandkids. From you bowing down and worshiping some stupid image that God said not to do because he's a jealous God. You don't bow down before anybody but before the Lord Jesus, before God Almighty. And you know, that's what worship really means, is bowing down. Look it up. Look up worship throughout the Bible. That's your homework. Go look up when the Bible talks about worshiping and what you're going to find is people getting down on their face, people bowing down, getting on their knees. That's worshiping. I think we barely scratched the surface on why God hates the Catholic Church. And just to reiterate, God wants the, the people that attend the Catholic Church to be saved and go to heaven. God loves them in that sense. He wants them to be saved and go to heaven. He does. And I do. And we do here at this church. We love people that attend Catholic Church, that are deceived, that are just doing it ignorantly in unbelief. They haven't heard the gospel. They don't know what's, what they're really doing. They, they, they are ignorant. Because most of them are. But you know who I hate and you know who God hates? All of the wicked leaders behind this religion. Pope, the, the people in these high places, the people who are coming out with all this false, damnable heresy doctrine and that are sending people to hell, preventing people from getting saved through their teachings. God hates that. I hate that. And you should hate that too. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray for the clear, I pray and thank you for the clear teaching that you give us pray that you would please help us to be able to apply your words appropriately and to be able to, to see and spot things that are wrong, that are wicked, that are just, just against the things of the Bible. And when what you tell us is true, what you tell us is right, dear Lord, help us to be able to call it out and help us to be able to do so in the proper spirit, Lord. We, um, we care about people. We want them to be saved. I care about the Catholics. I want them to be saved. But they need to understand that they're part of a false religion, that, they're, that their religion is going to send them to hell. I don't want that to happen. I want them to come to the knowledge of the truth of our, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help them to understand what Jesus was saying when, when he said that he is the bread of life. Help them to understand that so that they can receive it and, and receive that bread of life by putting their faith in him, not by thinking some cracker that they eat is becoming flesh in their mouth, Lord, but help to open up their understanding, open up their eyes, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to go out and, and preach to them and to, and to show them the truth and to give them the gospel and just give them an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, dear Lord. And it's in his name that we pray, amen.